Hello, we are here at Karen's Book Barn today, and we're going to be visiting with several authors. I don't know if you know it or not, but Karen's Book Barn every Saturday has a group of authors that come in. Sometimes there's one, sometimes there's four or five. If you like authors and you want to meet some of them, or murder mysteries all the way down to children's books, I think you would enjoy this visit. So see if you can find Karen's Book Barn in LaGrange, Kentucky, right beside the railroad tracks. Have a book, get a book, go outside, sit by the railroad tracks, and read a story and enjoy the evening. This is a great place to visit. Come go with us as we meet several authors today. Hello, Annetta. You have written several books, and they're for kids. Right. But you're inspired by what? When you wrote the first book, what inspired you? When I wrote the first book, I was inspired by my children. Uh, my husband's military, and he was in Iraq. And my children would say certain things, and uh, because my husband was away, I would stay up at night. So I um, would write certain things that they would say and decided um, later, way after, um, to put, them in, put those little things that they would say into a book. So that's why the first book is seven stories. Oh, my goodness. It's just it's the things that they think about and they don't have a way to express themselves sometimes. Right, right. And I, like I said, the first story is Trash Man Smile. Um, and the reason why I wrote that is because my son, when he was small, wanted to be a trash man. And uh, a friend of him said, that's a terrible job. Why would you want to be a trash man? But uh, this story tells about a trash man that's always smiling and is, and is really happy and blessed about the job he has. Well, it sounds like that your son had a pleasant experience with that man. He, he yes. influenced your son. Right, right. So that's, I think special in that respect right that he actually influenced him enough that he thought it was important Port, yes to be a trash man and make people happy when he went through the neighborhood yeah, exactly so exactly. that was that meant a lot to him while his dad was gone yes yes so that is yes. great now what inspired you to be an author you well you decided to write books but what event caused that well um growing up um and i didn't really find out until i was in community college but um i'm dyslexic so, um, growing up, I always written, and it was more poetry, right. but um, I never showed anybody because I knew there was probably a lot of words that were not correct, and a lot of words that no one could read but me. So, um, I never really showed anybody that I, you know, wrote, but I loved stories. And you kept that treasure hidden. Yes, yes. I loved stories, but never thought I could ever write a story. Oh. But, um... As time went by, and like I said, and with um, my children saying certain things after I had children, I said, you know, I would love to write a children's book. So I tucked those and did that. Um, but it's also inspiring. And I think just my story is inspiring for kids who may have a learning disability. Yes. Or um, feel that they're not good enough to do something. Right. So I um, write stories that hopefully would inspire kids. That's, I think that's great. And your husband had a great deal to do with that. My husband did. When we got married, um, actually he didn't know I was dyslexic for a whole year. And um, when he did, he started reading to me and he gave me some little uh, ideas of how to um, read. Um, one was by using my hand and one by, it was memorizing really. Um, so um, he helped me a great deal. He helped me a great deal. And right. I started even reading um, out loud. I wouldn't go to Bible study or anywhere that I had to read out loud. Right. And um, he helped me once I started reading out loud and had the confidence to do it. Um, and it got better. That's something a lot of people don't realize that people our age. Right. When we were in school, uh, the word dyslexia didn't come up. You know, if, if you had issues with learning, mm -hmm. you were categorized in something worse right. than dyslexia yes in which most dyslexic people are very intelligent right but they just have to learn in a different way exactly, exactly. and it was great that you had your husband even yes. though the teachers did not catch that in right. school but i don't think they understood it either because at I that time yeah and being yeah. in school and the teachers didn't understand it either right so it was yeah and they would teach everybody the same not knowing yes. that some kids have to be taught a little different right. A little diversity there goes a long way. Yes. So that yes. is great. Well, you're going to read part of this book for us here in just a minute. And uh, 
let them get a taste of your creativity. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> so, well, let's go listen to her read this book. I think you're going to love it. Hi, I'm Annetta Keys, and I'm an author, a children author. I have written two books. This is my first book, Joy is the Payment, and just written this one, Mama Isn't Lost, and Butterflies Return. Um, I write children book, inspiration children books. So um, this is a book was inspired by my children. Um, so it's seven short stories, and um, I wrote this book when my husband was in Iraq, uh, because my children would say certain things and I just wrote them down and ended up making a book out of them. Um, this book here was inspired by a, a friend of mine of 17 years that I met in Germany who came back to the States, who had a daughter who passed away, and um, she is now taking care of her grandsons, but this book tells a little bit about their story. So I'm going to read a little bit out of Joy is the Payment. I'm going to go ahead and read the first story, and this is called The Trash Man Smile. I'm on summer break from school, and I see Mr. Thomas every Wednesday morning between 8 and 8.15. He always looks so glad to be picking up the neighborhood trash. I think to myself, why would anybody be smiling about picking up trash. I, for one, don't even like to take out the trash. If my mom didn't remind me, I'm sure I'll forget most of the time. So why is Mr. Thomas so happy to pick it up? My family and I have been in this neighborhood about a year. We saw Mr. Thomas for the first time last summer. He would come by in his truck every Wednesday morning working and saying, good morning. Mom and Mr. Thomas introduced themselves. Mom told Mr. Thomas that she had a son and a daughter. I guess she also told them our names. Whenever we were outside after that, he would say hello and call us by our names. As I looked out my bedroom window, I think to myself, next Wednesday, I'm making sure I'm outside when he comes by. I'm going to ask Mr. Thomas what are you so happy about? Well, maybe not. It depends on how I feel that morning. I may not care next Wednesday why he's so happy. Uh, oh goodness. A week later, I didn't take out the trash because I needed to have a good excuse to run outside when Mr. Thomas' truck came by. I guess my mom forgot too because she didn't remind me last night. I'm glad about that. If she had, I would have think I would have to think up something some other reason to be outside. I guess I'm feeling like finding out why Mr. Thomas is always smiling. The truck came down the street and Mr. Thomas picked up trash after trash and emptied them into his not so big truck. There are two more houses before my house, so this is a great time to start walking towards the street with our trash can. Good morning, young man, Mr. Thomas said with that smile on his face. Good morning, I said back. So do you have great plans for the summer, young man? Yes, sir. I hope he isn't going to ask me what my plans are. I really just had great ideas. There's Mr. Thomason, the little boy. Before I could ask my longing question, Mr. Thomas began to tell me how much he likes to pick up trash in my neighborhood. This is a wonderful neighborhood. We're blessed to live here, and it's always good to see a young man like yourself helping your family. The parents in this street always say how their children do what they ask to do. It isn't always with a smile, but the job gets done. This is a perfect time to ask, Miss, ask why a smile is always on his face when he picks up the trash. But again, before I could get out the question, Mr. Thomas said, I'm so glad to have this job. I've been told I've had a smile on my face 
that people just don't understand. Wow, he is making this real easy for me, I thought. Let me tell you why. When I was a young man working for a big company in the city for about eight years, I got a letter from the CEO saying that they were downsizing the company. They, they were sorry, but they had to let me go. I was pretty upset about the news and just didn't know how I would have enough money to take care of my wife, a little boy, and another child on the way. I had given my life to God only a year before. I had to leave the company and I was not sure why he was allowing this to happen to me. So I got on my knees that night after losing my job and asked God to please help me find a job. The next day, one of my father's friends needed another hand to pick up trash, so he gave me the job. So that's a little bit about the first story. Like I said, there is seven short stories in the book, and they're inspira inspiration stories, and it's about helping one another and knowing that joy is the payment. Sometimes we help each other and we want something back, but joy is the payment. So this is a book for kids from age 5 to 12. Hope you enjoy. Donya, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. I think this is just wonderful. Getting a perspective of your side of it, why you wrote the book, and your book is called? Of Dreams and Tragedies. And it has a lot of different aspects to it, doesn't it? It has a lot going on. There's some family relations going on, there's romantic relations, there's tragedy, and it shows how different people deal with tragedies. Mm -hmm. and We're going to let her read some of this book here in a few minutes, and, and you're going to get a taste of it. So I think that's, that's even better, is to get a little taste of the book, because when you pick up a book, you really don't know what's in it. True. You're not sure what's going to be um, interesting, or if it's going to be a short story that, you know, so this is just great. So we're going to let you read that here okay. in a few minutes. What inspired you to be an author? I was homeschooling my children, and it was the second summer that we had, so I had everything ready and had a lot of time on my hands that I wasn't used to having after working and being a mom. And But I, I uh, resigned my position as a pharmacist and stayed home with them to homeschool, and I was reading a lot of books, and I was fussing about the books. Uh, one of them was had a pharmacist who was the bad guy, which, you know, that hit me wrong. No, it but wasn't nice. They were doing things with drugs that he never would have gotten away with, with controlled substances. Right. And injecting things in people that it would be impossible to inject things in people without them just suddenly so dying. So it was totally fiction. There was no it, real... There was no reality to, to it. it. And I was fussing about it. And my husband said, well, why don't you just write a book? So I decided to write a book. That was my first book, Always that I based somewhat on our relationship when we met and started out. Uh, but yes, that's so then I just had ideas kept coming to me, so I have kept writing, even though I've gone back to work now full-time. My kids are older, and but uh, yeah, I just enjoy it. Just I have these ideas coming. and I think it's interesting. Now, she told me earlier, and this I think is really cool, you get up during the middle of the night because you have conversations going on yes. with different characters, and you've got to write it down. Yes. How often does that happen? Oh, not maybe once a month. It's not. It's not a regular thing. It's a sporadic thing. So, but you're inspired, and something's happened during the day, mm -hmm. and when you go to sleep, you you get inspiration for your characters. Yes, and so you have to get up and you have to write what their mm -hmm. conversations are. Yes, before I lose it, before I forget what it right. is. Right. So now, how does your family deal with this? What do they think about all this? Oh, they just take it in stride, I suppose. They just know that. Well, that's mom. That's what she does. <laughs> I think that's neat. That's really neat. Thank you. Now, you're going to be, where are you going to be next? At the end of this month, um, mm -hmm. we're going to be here again in LaGrange, Kentucky, mm -hmm. um, at the Community Center for a, a large book fair. It's right. a seventh annual independent author book fair. Those that want to buy this book, where can they go find it? They can find it on Amazon and also Barnes & Noble. You can visit my website, which is www.dalawson.com. You can also look for me on Facebook. Look for Always the Novel, the novel in parentheses. Right. And that's how you can find me on Facebook. Oh, wow. Well, we really appreciate you being with us today. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Oh, this is just wonderful. I, I can't wait for people to read this book. I want to go read this one. So...
<laughs> well, thank you again so thank much. Thank you. Hi, I'm D.A. Lawson, and today I'm reading from the favorite book that I've written called Of Dreams and Tragedy. It recently earned a five-star uh, review on Reader's Favorite. Uh, I'm going to read, this book is told in two parts. It's about Allison and Michael. So you're going to meet Allison in my first segment that I'm going to read. This is from Chapter 2. It was Saturday, and I heard my sister get up and bang around in the kitchen. I stayed in bed. I didn't even open my eyes. Being asleep was better than real life, and I'd try to at least pretend to be asleep as long as I could. After a while, I heard my sister come into the small room we shared. Allie, she whispered. Oh, Allison. I stayed still with my eyes closed. That morning, waking up, even for Becca, wasn't worth it. I'd had my dream again, and I wanted to go back to it. Life was better in dreams. Allison, she said, raising her voice. Wake up, or all the icing's going to melt off the cake. Cake? It was my birthday, but we never got cake. Not at our house, anyway. I smelled something sweet and unfamiliar and opened my eyes. Becca leaned over me, holding one of our chip plates in both hands. On the plate was a round, kind of lopsided two-layer cake. Six pink candles stuck out from what white icing wasn't pulling around the edge of the plate. I looked back and forth between her and the cake, unable to believe she'd done this for me. I sat up slowly from the mattress in the corner that was my bed. Hurry and make a wish, Becca said. All the icing's gonna run off. She made a face and licked the icing off her thumb. I'm not sure, but I think I was supposed to let it sip after I took it out of the oven. I closed my eyes, made my wish, and blew out the candles. Rats, I was supposed to sing that song first. That's okay, I said, my voice sounding like a whistle because I'd lost my front two teeth. You made me a cake. I don't need a song. I smiled at her. Becca smiled too. Come on, let's eat it for breakfast. I think there might be some milk in the fridge. I jumped up, rubbed my eyes, and followed her to the kitchen. On the cracked and faded counter was a cake mix box, an empty plastic cup with vanilla frosting written on it, a dirty bowl and spoon, eggshells, and two round pans. How'd you get this stuff, Becca? I used some of my library money to buy the mix and icing. Miss Lynn let me borrow her pants and gave me the oil and eggs to make the cake. Becca worked at the library after school every day. Miss Lynn, the librarian, paid her, but our father didn't know that. He thought it was something she had to do for school. Becca kept the money hidden, otherwise he would take it. She was always telling me we'd use the money to get out of here one day. Ain't she afraid he'll find out? She cut two huge slices of cake and scooped spoonfuls of icing over them before she sat down opposite the rickety kitchen table. Ain't is not a word, Allison Lane White. Anyway, it's Saturday. He's still wherever he crashed last night. He won't show up here until nighttime. I'll have this mess cleaned up by then. I made a face. It's just us. Why can't I talk regular when it's just us? You should always use proper grammar, she said, sounding like my teacher at school. The way you speak says a lot about you as a person. You don't want people to think you are unintelligent or uneducated. Usually the six years Becca had on me didn't bother me, but when she got up all on her high horse about stuff like grammar, it did. Then I remembered that she made me a cake and taught me to read, something I could do better than anyone in my first grade class. Besides, she was the only person on earth who cared a thing about me. I kept my mouth shut and didn't smart off. We both dug into the cake with gusto. It was the best I'd ever had, even better than bought ones we had when Miss Lynn took us to parties at her church. Thanks, Becca, I said after we were both quiet for a while. You're the best sister ever. You're welcome. I wanted you to have a good birthday. Miss Lynn says birthdays are special, a day to let people we love know we care. And well, I love you more than anybody. After we finished our cake, I stayed in the kitchen and watched my sister clean up. She wouldn't let me help. Instead, I pumped her with questions about our mom, most of which I'd asked her many times before. I don't remember my mom. She left when I was too little to know anything, but Becca remembered her. You, sh you think she thinks about me today? You know, since it's my birthday. You think she remembers it's my birthday? It don't matter if she does or... Becca stopped talking and hugged. I mean, it doesn't matter if she thinks about you or not. I think about you. I love you. Some people don't have anybody. You and I, we've got each other. So then I'm going to skip to part the end of chapter five, and this is about Michael, who works at his grandfather's country store. And um, the first part of the book introduces them as children, and they both encounter tragedy. So you're going to see a little piece of the tragedy that Michael endures. <clears throat> okay, and this is, he's been working in that evening in the store. Together we counted down the register. That would be he and his grandfather. There wasn't a whole lot to count. It was the end of the month, and besides, farmers didn't usually carry a wad of money around in their tractors. Most of the sales had been charges. For those, Papal took the receipt, wrote the person's name on it, and placed it in the register drawer. The stack of charge slips was much thicker than all the cash put together. I put out, I pulled out those first and put them in a wooden box under the register. I totaled the checks, and Papal watched me. 
Then he wrote the amount on the deposit slip for the bank. Next was the paper money and change. I loved counting real money and made a point of saving it for last. I sorted it all into stacks, one for each denomination and one dollar bills in stacks of ten each. I stacked the coins too, quarters and stacks of fours, dimes and stacks of tens, and nickels and stacks of twenty. Finally, I counted the pennies to buy twos. After it was sorted, I totaled up all the stacks in extra change and gave Pavel the total. Either he trusted me or was good at counting along with me because, without my knowing because he always wrote down the figures without saying anything. When we were finished and the bank slip was filled out, Papo rummaged through the stuff under the counter. He stood up empty-handed. Tom, that was his nickname for, for Michael. I must have left the money bag in the storeroom. Would you run back and grab it? I nodded and headed in that direction. The bag wasn't in plain sight, so I had to look through piles of stuff. Except for the shelves where the products were placed for customers to see while they shopped, the store was, a, was completely unorganized. At least as far as I could tell. If Papo had a system, it was something only he understood. About the time I spotted the blue zipper lock bag with Lincoln National Bank printed on it, I heard the bell on the front door. I forgot to lock it. Papo asked me to before I started sweeping, but I had been thinking about Carly. Son, we're closed, Papa called, but if you need to pick up something quick, I can help you out. I couldn't hear any reply, but I did hear the sound of heavy footsteps and the creak of old wooden floorboards. I didn't know why, but I felt uneasy. The hairs on my arms rose and I felt a tingle like when Rich scooted his feet across the carpet before touching me and releasing a shock of static electricity. I slid toward the open storeroom door and peeked out. I saw a man I didn't recognize, which was weird. I knew everybody who came here. He was shorter than I was, but I could tell he was older than me. The color of his long, stringy hair was hard to make out because it was so dirty. He wore a tank-type undershirt that had probably been white at one time, but was now a muddy brown color. He had on a pair of torn, faded jeans and heavy work boots. I couldn't tell much about his face because his side was torn me, but he seemed really twitchy and nervous. His hands shook as he lifted a cigarette to his mouth. The end of it glowed when he inhaled. After throwing the butt down, he grounded into the floor with his boot. The tingling sensation grew stronger. A huge tattoo covered the man's left arm. It was a dragon snake-like thing that ran all the way from the back of his left hand up to his bicep where a creature's head was. It had fangs, dripping blood, and evil yellow eyes that seemed to be glaring right at me. Sada, the man said. Sudu. He shook his head. Them red sinus pill things. I want those. Give me all you got. Sorry, son, Papo answered. I don't carry any medicines here. The pharmacy in town would have it, but they're closed now. You'll have to drive over to E-Town or wait until... I ain't your son, the man stopped toward the counter. That's when I saw the gun. It was tucked into the back of his pants, its color a sharp contrast against the lighter brown of his shirt. My heart pounded in my chest and my eyes flew to my Papo's face. I could tell Papo knew something wasn't right about the guy, but he didn't look frightened. I glanced at the phone behind the counter, knowing I wouldn't be fast enough to get to it and dial for help before the man shot us. I pressed myself against the wall just inside the storeroom. Papo said something about trying to be friendly and not meaning any offense. My mind raced, trying to figure out what to do. I didn't think I could run to a phone, call the police, and get help out here quickly enough to do any good. Instead, I searched the storeroom for some kind of weapon, any kind of weapon. I grabbed a can of Van Camp pork and beans, the largest can in the storeroom. It felt heavy in my hand, and I hoped to do some damage against the man's head. I eased back to the storeroom door and peered out. I was relieved to see the gun still sticking out of his jeans. Papa calmly placed the money he'd just counted into a small paper bag. I let out my breath. The man would take the money and leave, and we'd be all right. With an expression of pity on his face, Papa handed the bag to the man. I prayed that this would be the end of it, that the twitchy, nasty, tattooed man would leave, and we'd never see him again. To my horror, the man pulled out the gun and pointed it at Papa's face. Papa Dan didn't flinch. If anything, he only looked more sorry for the man. I didn't feel sorry for him. I wanted to kill him. I took one long step toward him and raised the camera behind and above my head as if I were preparing to throw a baseball across a field. Before I could launch my weapon, the man cocked the gun and pulled the trigger. I watched blood, Papal Dan's blood, splatter over the packages of candy, gum, and cigarettes behind the counter. He leaned back, momentarily suspended, before he thudded against the shelf and behind him. His body slid down. His head thumped against each and every shelf, leaving a trail of blood and brain matter. City blackness surrounded the crimson remains of his nose. His body landed on the floor with a sickening thunk. I heard a sound like the cry of a wounded wild animal and realized the sound had come from deep in my chest. I felt myself stop forward with no conscious thought of doing so. The murderer turned and pointed his gun at me. Without hesitation, I sent the can hurling toward his head with all the power of my body, my anger, and my hatred. The can hit its mark with a satisfying sound of bone and flesh smashing. The man lowered the gun and staggered. He leaned heavily against the counter. Blood ran down the left side of his face. I expected him to crumple to the floor. Instead, he shook his head and, re after remaining motionless for a few heartbeats, pushing against the counter, he righted himself. An evil smile spread over his dirty, ugly face. 
What teeth he had were broken and gray. My God, I thought, he isn't human. The power I'd felt hurling the can left me. Terror took its place. My arms darted around the store, searching for something to use to protect myself. I wished Hal's grocery carried baseball bats. My only hope of survival was escape. I turned and ran. Why, you son of a... The blast of the gun drowned out the, my attacker's words. I felt a burning, searing pain low in my back. The force of the gunshot propelled me forward. The side of my face landed hard against the doorframe of the storeroom before I slid to the floor. I heard the sound of boots against the wood floor. The murder was moving away from me. Then I heard the jangle of the bell on the door when, I, when it opened and closed, followed by the sound of an engine outside. He was gone. I wanted to use my hands to push myself up. I didn't know if my brain wouldn't work or my arms wouldn't work, but no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get off the floor, couldn't move a muscle. I needed to get help, needed to save Papa. The burning sensation in my back spread, and then a deep coldness took hold of me. There was light, but nothing else. I didn't know if my eyes were open or closed. I tried to open them, and nothing happened. I tried to blink, and nothing happened. Thoughts and images flew through my mind. I was going to die. I hope Mom wouldn't see me like this. I was sure I didn't look too great right now. I saw Carly's pretty smiling face and wished I'd gotten a chance to fill my lips against hers. It made me sad to think she'd grow up to marry someone else. I hope she had fun at Disney World. I wondered who would take my place on the basketball team. I wondered if Richard would miss me. I saw myself getting baptized, saw the smiles I'd been on my family's faces. I heard Papa singing, I'll fly away, and wished I could fly away, away from the pain and the cold. Then I felt something soft against my cheek. I could smell the warm, sweet smell of vanilla. It reminded me of Nana pulling cookies from her oven. The scent was so strong, so close. Hang on, Michael, a voice said. The voice was soft and low and soothing, but I didn't recognize it. I wanted to hear more of it, to do whatever it told me to do. Stay with me, Michael. It's not your time to go. I wanted to ask the voice about Papa, but I couldn't make my mouth move any more than the other parts of my body. The images, the memories stopped scrawling, but a figure appeared. I saw the dirty, ugly face, the stringy hair, the horrible tattoo. My Papa was dead. I knew it. I couldn't help him. No one could help him now. For less than $150, that man killed Papa Dan. I silently prayed that God would forgive me for hating a man. And then everything went black.